Today is a very special episode of Tom Talks. We're featuring a Ferrari 250 Testarossa, and not just any Ferrari 250 Testarossa, but one that is regarded as the greatest of them all. Chassis number 0704, or 704 as it's known to its friends, was a factory prototype. It was the second 250 Testarossa ever built. It was a factory works car that was driven by the greatest drivers in the world in period, and it won many races. It then later in its life spent over 30 years in the Henry Ford Museum. Its ownership provenance is fantastic. And most importantly, it's the only unrestored Testarossa in existence today. This is a very special car. I sold this car back in 2014, and at that time it was the highlight of my career. I would still consider it the highlight of my career, and I think it will always be the highlight of my career. Now, a 250 Testarossa in general is a very special car. It came about because the World Sports Car Championship announced from 1958 it would limit the engine capacity in the sports racing prototypes to three litres, which meant that Ferrari's monstrous 315S and 335S suddenly became obsolete. In total, Ferrari built 22 250 Testarossas over 57 and 58, and only five of those cars were works cars. Works cars, I'm sure a lot of you are all very familiar with, but to emphasize the importance of a works car, these were cars that had all of the factory development behind them. These are cars that the actual Ferrari factory, the team, went racing with. Although the regulations didn't change until 1958, Ferrari, in preparation for the new season, unveiled their new model, the 250 Testarossa, in 1957. And the cars they unveiled were 0704, the second factory prototype, alongside 0666, the first factory prototype. Now, this particular car was first born and unveiled to the public and first raced with the pontoon style front fenders. That was later changed because the drivers found that the pontoon fenders were unstable at high speeds, long straights, such as Le Mans. And where this car was a true development car, it was the second prototype, it was the first Testarossa with the pontoon fender, and it was the first Testarossa that was then converted back, a works car that was converted back to the envelope style body that it wears today, is that no other works car after 704 was ever a pontoon fender again, because they found from this car that the car performed a lot better at Le Mans, at any long high speed straights with the envelope and closed body. First raced in 1957 at Le Mans, the car ran as high as second place before retiring. It then raced in the Swedish Grand Prix, and then at the end of the season, it raced in the Venezuelan Grand Prix, all in preparation for their new season, all for 58, all for the new regulations of the engine capacity being limited to three litres. So it ran alongside the 315Ss, it ran alongside the 335Ss, but they were just preparing it for the new season. We then get to the 1958 season, and the first race of the new championship is Buenos Aires. 704 was assigned to Peter Collins, the boy from Kidderminster, and Phil Hill, the boy from California. Both two phenomenal drivers of their era. Phil Hill was the first ever American Formula One world champion, and Peter Collins, I think, had so much style. He had a great, um, a great way of driving, extremely quick, both absolutely top of the tree at Ferrari at that time. They were assigned to 704 and they won the first race of the season. The second race of the season was the 12 hours of Sebring, which is probably only second on the calendar to Le Mans. It's 
very significant race, 12 hours, a tough endurance race. And again, Hill and Collins assigned to this car brought it home in first place, which is just phenomenal. You know, the car to have one major race win like that is incredible. To have two, the first two races of the 58 championship is, you know, there's not many cars that have ever done that. The third race, Targa Florio, same drivers were assigned to the car, so you can only assume that either Ferrari thought it was a pairing that shouldn't be broken up, maybe the old man was superstitious, maybe the drivers were superstitious. Either way, the same drivers drove this car for Targa Florio and, and they come home in fourth place. Another good finish. The car then went to the Nürburgring and because it didn't keep its winning streak up, the drivers were swapped. Peter Collins was still kept with 704, but this time his teammate was the legendary Mike Hawthorne. Now, Mike Hawthorne also won the Formula One World Championship in 1958, so he was a driver well in form. Now, this car at the Nürburgring should have won the race. It was, it was winning by a considerable distance, and it then had a blowout in one of the tires which meant that it came home in second place behind the Aston Martin DBR1 but ahead of all the other 250 Testarossas. So the first four races of the championship season this car finishes first, first, fourth, second. Phenomenal. Apart from the a small little dent in the rear driver's wing at Buenos Aires, which evidence of that dent, the repair to that dent is still on this car today. Um, the car had no major damage. It had phenomenal uh, finishes, results, first, first, fourth, second. And it then headed in to the biggest race of the season, which was Le Mans. At that time, the car had scored more points than any other Testarossa, any other works car, any other customer car, and it was the only car, the only Testarossa to compete in the first five rounds of the season. So it goes to Le Mans, the car is given to, again, to Mike Hawthorne and Peter Collins. Uh, the car was doing very well. Uh, it had the fastest lap at Le Mans that year, but it didn't finish, and it didn't finish because um, apparently Mike Hawthorne wasn't a fan of Le Mans and he was so heavy on the clutch at the start that the clutch didn't last and that was the reason why it retired. It didn't retire because it had a bad accident, it had a fire, nothing like that. It retired because of a clutch failure which they put down to Mike Hawthorne. And apparently Mike Hawthorne and Peter Collins uh, got straight in the car, drove back and watched the finish of the race that when a sister envelope bodied 250 Tessarossa chassis 0728 uh, won and they were watching it from a, a pub in Surrey. The final race of the 58 championship season was at Goodwood and Ferrari decided not to participate, not to send any cars because they had no need, because they had already won the championship. And they won the championship because of the points won by this particular car. This car won more points than any other Testarossa in the championship. It won its two races. It came second at the Nürburgring, fourth at the Targa Florio, and Ferrari decided we don't need to race at Goodwood, so they didn't bother. Following its success in the 58 season, and after being a works development car for two years, over 57 and 58, Ferrari sold 704 to their North American West Coast distributor, John von Neumann. John immediately continued to race the car. Uh, he had his stepdaughter, Josie von Neumann, behind the wheel. A very quick young lady, actually, who had a lot of success with it. And he also had a young Richie Ginther. Now, Richie was another great driver. He went on to race in Formula One. Which brings me on to the appreciation that we should have for all of the fantastic drivers that drove this car in period. 
it's quite unique because you know there's there's lots of works cars that didn't have maybe that many outings and they were driven by one or two or maybe three drivers but 704 the list of drivers that is associated to this car that drove this car is just phenomenal first in 57 its first two outings it was driven by Jean de Bienne and Trintignon now Jean de Bienne let's think about it this guy won Le Mans four times he won the Tour de France three times at the moment my son's obsessed with watching this uh, Le Mans 66 Ford v Ferrari and you know he was talking about how sad it was that Ken Miles didn't get to win Le Mans at all and you know how difficult the race was and Jean de Bienne won Le Mans four times and he won it all those four times in a Testarossa. Trintignon you know he won Le Mans um, then the car Maston Gregory drove the car uh, you have Mike Hawthorne, the 1958 Formula One world champion who was driving this car in 58. Peter Collins, Phil Hill, Wolfgang Seidel. You have so many great drivers as associated to it. And anyway, back, back to North America. Um, so the car was, uh, Jean von Neumann owned it. Uh, he had a good bit of success in the car. And Fortunately, his marriage wasn't as successful and he uh, divorced his wife, Eleanor, and Eleanor ended up with 704, some other very significant cars, and his Ferrari dealership. He had an absolute nightmare. Uh, she immediately sold 704 to um, a gentleman, a well-known guy back in that period called Jack Nethercutt. Uh, Jack Nethercutt then sold the car to um, uh, somebody called Dick Hahn. Uh, Dick Hahn had a driver race the car for him, continue to race the car in North America, uh, a young racing driver called Jerry Grant. Jerry Grant won at least 17 races in 704, 17. He raced the car at least 28 times and this is what our research has unearthed at, at least 28 times he won at least 17 races and in all of those races and thinking about its time when it was a works car when it was a works car the only damage it ever suffered was a little dent on the back wing and when it was racing in North America it had some dents down the driver's side on the front wing and on the door, but never no serious crashes. After Jerry Grant won all those races, the car was then sold to um, a young gentleman called Arthur True. Now, Arthur True raced the car about six, seven times and his number was number 38. And that's where this number comes from today, this uh, gothic looking painted number. And unfortunately, Arthur True, as a very young man, passed away. And, um, uh, you know, passed away from a bad illness. And the car, he left all of his cars, which was 704, a 300SL Gullwing and something else to the Henry Ford museum where this car resided for the next 30 odd years there's no doubt that this car was saved because it was donated to the museum back in that period in the 60s and throughout the 70s there were so many great cars lots of gto's and lots of testarossas that was just messed around with on the racing scene original engines were changed for Chevrolet units or Ford V8 units because they were more cost efficient to run and easier to maintain. You know, bodies on some Testarossas were changed and messed around with by not just little alterations, but changed into a coupe style enclosed body design. And today, you know, unfortunately, it just means that the cars are are wearing new bodies 
and cars that have lost their original engines, where this car was preserved throughout those years because it was in an absolute institution, being the Henry Ford Museum. I know lots of clients of mine, and I'm sure lots of other people, uh, approach the museum and try to find a way to buy the car when cars became way more collectible and way more valuable from the late 80s and just had no way of doing it. Ford, you know, they've never been one that had to be motivated by money. So the offers that they were receiving didn't really mean that much to them. But then uh, an American gentleman called uh, Jerry, Jerry Helk masterminded something. He, his father, he was left from his father uh, um, an early 20th century great American racing car, a 16 cylinder locomobile. And he convinced the museum that that locomobile was way more historically important to an American institution than an old Ferrari racing car. And Ford accepted that and they managed to do a part exchange and the car then left the museum and was immediately sold to a, uh, a great collector, a connoisseur collector um, called Abba Kogan. And Abba Kogan kept the car basically untouched exactly as it was in the Henry Ford Museum for about the next seven years. And he then sold the car to Pierre Morin and Pierre Morin decided to do a complete mechanical recommissioning of the car, uh, which was carried out in the UK. And then Pierre Morin sold the car a few years later to another discerning collector called Eric Harima, who I bought the car from in late 2013. I then sold the car in early 2014 and had the privilege, the new owner uh, didn't want to take the car to Pebble Beach himself and he, he asked and offered the opportunity to me if I would take the car um, because, because in 2014 it was the 250 Testarossa year at Pebble Beach. There was a fantastic array of lots of Testarossas lined up um, and I think back on it now and you know, all those beautiful cars and some fantastic Testarossas and TR59s and TR60s and 61s were all lined up and all of them were gleaming, beautifully restored. And then you had this old, original, unrestored car um, in the middle and everybody was attracted to it like a magnet and everybody was coming up and talking about it and saying it's, it's phenomenal. Um, I remember Sir Jackie Stewart coming up to me on the lawn and commenting on how it was easily his favorite car at the event and he still talks about it now when um uh, when i bump into him and uh the car that year was awarded uh four special awards including the fever post-war uh, award for the best preserved car at the show which is you know, a, a great attribute to any car because at pebble beach it's the the motoring calendar event is where all the special cars are and you know you have to also give it some consideration to think that I'm a used car dealer and the car people knew that this wasn't my own personal car that was in the event that year and the judges prefer to award the great awards and have the owners up on stage to receive the great awards. Um, and it, I made it public knowledge that I was displaying the car in 2014 on behalf of the owner, that I didn't own the car at that time, yet the car still won all of those awards, uh, which was a fantastic experience and again brought me closer to the car. On a technical detail, these three litre V12 engines produced 300 brake horsepower, which must have felt phenomenally quick back in the late 50s, as even when I drive the car today, it feels very quick and the car handles extremely well. All customer 
250 Testarossas, of which there were 17, were fitted with a four-speed all synchro mesh gearbox. However, the works cars, such as 704, benefited from a transaxle. Now, when we look inside the engine bay, there's so many, there's just so many things to point out on this car, to, it's the sign of its originality. But, and because the car was a works car, and because it raced in all of these major international races, we benefit from having lots of period images of the car. And when you have period images, it's great to be able to compare to the current images on all the different areas of the car. And when you look inside at the engine bay, it's one of the, it's one of the most important areas to, to see the car's development and transformation throughout the races and over the years up until today. And, you know, when I look in here now, you see the first thing that you notice on the engine itself, you see the Lamar Scrutineers CSAI stamping on the engine block from when it raced at Lamar in 57 and in 58. You see, you know, in some of the early images, I think it was an image from uh, Sebring, you'll see that the car originally ran as a works car with four coils, two of them being spares. Um, and then when the car left the factory, the car left on two coils. And today you can see where the holes have been blanked in for the four coils. That shows all its originality and this work that was done when it left the factory back in late 58. You, you see where the car was changed from a center throttle and it was, you know, if that work would have been done by somebody who restored the car or if the car would have ever been got at ever in its life, all of this would have been tidied up. But when the car was being raced and the technicians, whether it was Mario, Luigi or Paolo, they didn't think about, let's make this car look beautiful. They thought about, you know, let's get it ready for the, for the next race. And throughout the engine bay, there's lots of, there's lots of areas that you see the development of the car. The, the one thing that I really love as well, to show that the car retains its original body, this has its original body from day one. And when you look inside the wings, if you recall, I mentioned that this car started its life as the first ever pontoon fender Testarossa and it's now in the envelope design because of the pontoon fender being unstable at high speeds. Um, this car didn't have a new nose end grafted onto it, or it didn't have a completely new nose, which been, would have been probably quite easy for Scaglietti to have done back in period. But the actual body, the alterations that was done from the pontoon fender to the envelope body, all the welding is still evident today which is fantastic. And then we spoke about in Buenos Aires in its very first race, it had a small dent that, that managed to happen in, whilst the car was racing in the, in the rear driver's wing. And when you look inside there today, you can see the patch repair from its first race in 58. You know, we're now in 2020, 62 years later, the car raced at least, it won at least 17 races with um, Jerry Grant. That was after its works life, yet it's still got the dent from its very first race of 58. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. You know, you, you look at all of the Testarossas, and I know these cars particularly well. You know, I studied all of them and there's not one other Testarossa that benefits from these huge, beautiful, bulbous rear wings like this car does. Um, when it sat at Pebble Beach in 2014 and it was lined up against all of the other cars, include, including some of the other envelope bodied cars, and you look at these rear wings, they sit so much prouder, they're so much more curvaceous. It's just, it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful design and a survivor. 
and exactly as it was when Enzo Ferrari was walking by in the factory or when it was racing in any of those major races or when it went to the Henry Ford Museum. This is a, a survivor, a car that needs to be preserved. And I, I think if you asked any of the world's most prominent collectors, name their top five cars. Today, there's a real emphasis on originality because you can go and buy any car that's been destroyed or had a very bad life and you can go and give it to the greatest restorers in the world go and give it to Paul Russell and spend a million dollars or two million dollars and the car can be resurrected and it can look beautiful and it can look exactly the same as maybe that car that won that major race back in whatever year it was however if you ask yourself this the question and if you really do compare cars to art and you say okay what is left on this car compared to when it won Sebring, Buenos Aires, Le Mans, wh whatever it may well have been, Nürburgring, whatever major race or whatever it done back in period, back in time and you ask yourself the question and say what's left on that car? Is it the same chassis? Is it the same body? Is it the same engine? There's not many cars that tick those boxes. However, there's none, or I can't think of any, that ticks as many boxes as 704. Original engine, original transaxle, original chassis, original body, original wounds and scars and evidence that was left from those races that the world's greatest racing drivers were driving this car in period. It's just, this is an unrepeatable car and it's a car that I've been very proud to be associated with and it's a car that I'll always be proud to be associated with and I hope you enjoyed hearing about it.